Hello and welcome to the Outcast. I'm your host HC, and with me is Wolf. And today, oh boy, we are in for a big one because we are going to talk about Harry Potter. What exactly? The books, the movies, the games, the something else? We are here to talk about all of Harry Potter. Why did we decide this? Honestly, because I just saw the, all of the movies again and not so long ago, and I felt like talking about it. But yeah, we are here to we are here to go about the, for the long run. Um, few notes before we start. And, uh, note number one: obviously, spoilers throughout <laughs> all of this. <laughs> and we are we are not gonna do the usual non-spoiler, non-spoiler, yes, spoiler talk because. For one, if you're listening to this, you probably know everything there is to know about Harry Potter. Like, you know, it's been a, it's been a, a everything has been out for a while now. Mm-hmm. So, like, you, you, if you are, if you even decide to, decided to listen to this, you know very well what's happening. So there's no reason to really bother with the spoiler warnings, but you got one now. And then, also another thing I want to point out concerning recent events, we are aware that J.K. Rowling has been saying some stupid things lately. But the thing, the thing is, is that this podcast is not about that. We are very much aware that what she says is, is hurtful, it's bullshit, and I personally don't agree with what I mean, she's saying as well. But this is not this is not our point in there this is... podcast. We're just we're just trying to talk about stuff we like and have fun with it. There is a just question because... or two I think we should bring up though when we get more into talking about the movies and the books and things like that, right? And I, I think it would be a disservice not to ask this question. So I'm going to ask it. You're going to get mad at me, but I'm going to ask it. But later, uh, I'll let people well, ruminate but... on what that question might be. <laughs> But the thing, what I'm saying is though, is that that's in context. But yeah, to let's be the franchise itself. This oh yeah, let, not, let's be very clear. J.K. Rowling is being an absolute bell end, especially towards trans people. She needs to stop that, especially using her large following and wealth to basically hurt trans people. Essentially, yeah, don't I, be a bitch, J.K. Rowling. Forgive my yeah, language, but sorry, you're being I, one. Yeah, as someone, as someone who has a very good trans friend, this, uh, you know, I'm very mad about this, but at the same time, the podcast isn't about, you know, sh- about necessarily going down to her level. We are, mm-hmm. if you want to ask me something about this later on, by all means, but at the same time, the podcast is going to be about Harry Potter and we're not going to let what she said cloud our judgment. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. To it's the best of our ability. <laughs> yeah, it's very important sometimes to distinguish the other, the, you know, the other from the text. Mm-hmm. As much as it's kind of hard in this case, because she is basically the text. She has been involved in basically everything about this franchise, but mm-hmm. whatever. So, um, here we go. Harry Potter. Let's start with kind of the basics. How were you exposed to the oh, boy, boy. Who lived? Um, Well... Let's go way back to when Wolf was a young lad. Um, so, a bit of a tangent, boring tangent, I suspect. You know, I was a terrible reader when I was much younger. Like, I could not read worth a shit when I was younger. Same, same. This is part <clears throat> like, of my story, too. <laughs> like, you know, my, my story was, you know, third grade I had a teacher who basically went well above and beyond what she needed to, and she basically taught me how to read, essentially. Because I did not know how. I didn't know how to sound out words. It would take me a long time just to get through a single sentence, right? But she took me to the side and said, you know, I can spend this time with you. I can help you to become a better reader if that's what you want to do. And, you know, it gets really old being embarrassed in class and having people kind of laugh at you when you're a young kid, when you don't know how to read or you're terrible at reading. So I took her up on it. And she taught me how to read. But it wasn't, but she, she taught me how to read. And, but it wasn't until, I would say, fifth grade when I had another teacher who basically eschewed the reading list for that school year and said, you know what, none of you want to read this. None of you care to read this, it seems. So why don't we do something different? Why don't we let you pick out books you want to read? And a lot of us picked out extremely easy books, like very easy books to do report to read and do reports on. And she's like, that's not going to work. 
here's a book from my collection my fifth grade teacher did and it was the first harry potter book believe it or not mm-hmm. and you, got, you know i was about to say i hope that they didn't drop you in the middle like this that'd be a little weird with... mm-hmm. but you gotta remember this is fifth grade for me so that's like late 90s early 2000s so not all the books were out by then yeah. also you're american so you have the wrong title of the first harry potter book because it's philosopher stone not sorceress i ask details but, yeah. but yeah she it was my fifth grade teacher who taught me that reading could be fun, that reading could be enjoyable. And she did so with introducing me to the first Harry Potter book. And um, that's how I got into cool. it. Mm-hmm. Well, my story is a bit more unconventional, I guess, because mm-hmm. by the time i by the time I, like, like you, it's not a sign that I needed help reading. It's just, I never got into books. Books were mm-hmm. never really my medium. I've read books, I like books, but... Until fifth grade, I didn't either. Yeah, but the thing is that, you know, even after reading stuff like Harry Potter or Night School, for example, I am more of a movie guy or show. Like, if you tell me that there's an adaptation of a book, I'll watch the movie before reading the book. And it's not necessarily... It's just who I am. It's nothing mm-hmm. against the book themselves. Oh, that's fair. But, and so... Harry Potter was just a name I've heard of for the longest time. Like, I just remember seeing ads or the books in a bookstore, and I would know that there are four. I didn't know in what order they came from. I just know, I just knew there are four books. Mm-hmm. And, by, and by the way, the ads pointed them out. Uh, Goblet of Fire was the first one, and, and Chamber of Secrets was the fourth, which is completely backwards, but who cares? Um, the, Wait. so Wait, what? For some reason, the way the ads here advertise the four Harry Potter books that were out at the time, they pointed, they kind of showed it as Goblet of Fire being number one and Chamber of Secrets being number four, which is... That'd be so complete, weird. Yeah, it's completely wrong, but uh, advertisers, you know, ads gonna add, I guess. Uh, that's just weird, though. Like... Harry's gone back in time. Yeah, gotta go back in time. Where would the first, but where would the first book be? Three or two? Uh, that's something I don't remember. I just, you know, <laughs> it, I just remember that in the order, like, uh, you know, Goblet of Fire was to the, was the most to the left because, and Chamber of Secrets was the most to the right. So it's so weird. Yeah, it's so weird, but whatever. Um, but so the thing is, it's just a name I heard, but thought nothing of it. And then, and then you know, as when the first uh, movie was coming out, uh, the Philosopher Stone movie, um, there was a thing. There was there was a thing here in Israel where if something was popular, they they would have sticker albums of it. And the thing about those sticker albums, I'm not sure if you had those, is that, like, you'll buy the, the album and then you'll have to buy stickers and, you know, stick them to the places where they needed to be. And if you collected all of them, you'll have to send it to a specific address. And if you were the first one, you would receive a tool to the Hogwarts set. And such and such rewards, depending on the franchise. Hmm. So, Neat. so my, so my dad's friend, uh, you know, ran a business where he sold those kind of things. So my, so I would usually get these uh, these albums without even asking for them. My dad would just give them to me, mm-hmm. and and it's like, and then one day I saw like, oh, this is live action. This is not animated or an Argentinian teen show or something. This is something else. And, uh, oh, it's Harry Potter. Oh, I know that name. These are these books. Okay, sure. And, you know, I just started collecting them, like I did everything else. And then, you know, among the cards, we did, there were all of these ads for this movie coming out. And I'm like, oh, they're making a movie about Harry Potter. I wonder. And then, and then you know, talking to people, talking to people, we kind of realized, oh, the Philosopher Stone is the first book, and so, and that's kind of how I fell into it through mm-hmm. a sticker album. I'm sure you didn't see this one coming. 
No, it makes sense knowing you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I guess. <laughs> I'm joking. It, it makes sense because it's you. If it was anyone else, it would, it would make sense. But because it's me, I'll take it as a compliment. But um, yeah, this is kind of our personal, how we got into it. Now all we have to do is just go over them one by one, I guess. So Philosopher's Stone, you said you, you, know, you got the book for, recommended by your teacher. Uh, so what are your thoughts about... What so it's recommended, it was, this is the book you're reading to do a report on. I think you'll like it. And it's... Mm-hmm. I didn't think I would like it, but I ended up liking it. Okay. All right, so, general thoughts about Philosopher's Stone. The book or the movie? Uh, kinda, you know, it's kind of... It's probably going to blend, so... Whatever. Um... So it's been years since I've read the book. Let's be clear. I did not have the chance to... This is Actually, this is probably another note before we get into this. It's easier for us to revisit the movies than the book. It's because, especially for me, because the book is a bit more time-consuming. The movie is mm-hmm. two hours and it's done. So we'll probably... Two hours, though. Probably... We're going to get into that in a minute. <laughs> okay. But the thing is... I have some thoughts. Okay. But the thing is, a movie is less of a process to, you know, catch up on. This, so yeah, I if agree. We, so if we remember the movies more, it's not necessarily saying that the movies are better than the books or anything. It's just, it's just easier for us to refresh our perspective on. Mm-hmm. So I think there's one thing we should probably ask right, right here at the start. Yeah. And, I, I do, and I do think it's worth asking. Yeah, definitely. It's because I, you know, went through and watched the movies now recently and re uh, refamiliarized myself with all the movies now and the stories. And I've not had the, yeah, and again, as we said, the books are a little bit too time consuming to get to for how we record. That would have taken much, much longer. <laughs> so yeah. the book is a bit more off memory somewhat. But I do have to ask, right, considering J.K. Rowling's been on a right bell end right at the moment. Yeah. Does that influence your enjoyment of the franchise book or movie in any way? You know, on the one hand, I want to say no, because, like I said, there is uh, there is uh, there is this kind of thing that, you, like I said earlier, you kind of need to sometimes disconnect the author from the text. Mm-hmm. And just and just you know every time he, you know a, cre- a certain creator says something controversial or, and stuff, it it is important to you know sometimes distinguish the creator from from the art. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying this because Harry Potter in itself doesn't have any messages against trans people. You know, it's not like I'm seeing Philosopher's Stone or Chamber of Secrets or any of those, and I think. Oh, I can totally see her putting an agenda into this specific art form. I don't, I don't think this. I don't think about that. So this doesn't bother me when I revisit Harry Potter specifically. Yeah. So, uh, however, there is something that uh, if you know Lindsay Ellis, uh, she's doing a lot of videos, and she just did a video about this, and she brought up a good point. That, you know, that on the other hand, I can see how people will get that impression because J.K. Rowling, for all intents and purposes, is Harry Potter. She is involved in all the books. She, she, is, she was involved in all the movies to a certain degree. She is still, she is writing the Fantastic Beasts movies, which, by the way, we won't cover here. That's, his own, that's its own thing. And, um, I've heard they're not know, very was, good, though, anyways. Yeah, that's it. That's for another day. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, the, but the thing is that, so, you know, she's still doing Fantastic Beasts. Uh, she also helped somewhat with the Broadway show, which we may talk about. I don't know. Uh, oh, sorry, but that's thing, not very good. Uh, I'll have some words about this. But uh. the thing is... But the thing is, she's still the world. She's still this universe. And I can see... Yeah, because you know sometimes with franchises like this, it can go it can go on to other people, and you know it kind of loses that you know there's the creator and there are the people who took over. 
But here it's not necessarily, she's still a part of this universe. She is still this universe. So I can see how people can, can people's enjoyment of Harry Potter can diminish because of her nonsense. Oh yeah, I completely agree with that. I think for me personally, I would find it hard to, harder to go back to the books maybe. But the movies, I think I can disconnect a bit more personally because yeah. of all the really amazing actors that are in all of them. And, you know, and again, yeah, seem like a lot of these actors who, grow the, up, too. And act yeah, and the actors also spoke up against them. Mm -hmm. when, that, I'm sure, uh, doesn't hurt as well. But yeah, for me, I think the movies I can still watch and get some enjoyment out of that are that is disconnected from, you know, J.K. Rowling, the author. I can yeah. disconnect her from the movies and say, you know what, these can still stand on their own for me, for, for at least me personally. Mm -hmm. Now, with that said, looking back at Philosopher's Stone, it's definitely, you can, you can, those effects are somewhat dated now. <laughs> well, uh, keep in mind this movie is like, man, next year it's going to be 20 years old. Yes. Oh yes. <laughs> I'm so old. It's a very old movie. <laughs> But um, mm -hmm. I still enjoyed it. Like, there's, I think the first movie you can kind of tell there's this, almost you know, we weren't given a ton of budget. We don't know if this is going to succeed and become a thing. So I guess one thing about the first, the first movie that I, you know, first of all, as a movie and, and both the movie and the book, I would say is that they are not the strongest of the franchise, of the respective mm -hmm. series, like, for, it's not the best of the books, it's not the best of the movies, but at the same time, it does a job well enough of, of you know, getting you into this world. And also, you can tell that, you know, when Rowling wrote it, it was like, this is my passion project, I'm going to put everything into it, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it will catch on, but I'm gonna try. And, and, and I do the think movie, the movie comes across in a similar way, too. Yeah, I was about to say that the movie also, you can tell that this was before it became a huge franchise and people just wanted to make it. Mm -hmm. This was, you know, this was the one that, you know, we believe in this, we believe in this book, we believe in this, in this director, we believe in everything. We have to do this. And so, you know, so again, it's not the strongest of the franchises by any means, but at the same time, I think it's still a good one. It's it's a good entry point, and it's good that you know it's the first one, so it's good that you can enter into it easily. But at the same time, you're not necessarily spoon fed into the stuff that's gonna come yep. later. You you're still getting your money's worth. I would agree, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, for me personally, like, you, I don't know. To me, looking you know, rewatching all the films, you know, a little bit more back to back this time. It was interesting because you can kind of, there, there's this, and I guess it's on purpose, right? Because it has to be, because it's introducing you to the world. But there's definitely more of a whimsy to the first film than there is later films. In, ge in general, like, the, this is a thing that, you know, the first, the, the first uh, few movies and books are a bit more whimsical and, you know, a bit more child friendly i now, should say to be fair considering the subject matter of the later films it does make some sense but i, I don't know it just it kind of stood out to me as this interesting little tidbit when we watching the first film yeah and and again i can appreciate that you know you start small you start you start with the whimsy you start with the magic you start with everything before when and also you know harry is 11 in that uh, in that book slash movie so it kind of makes sense that, you know, for an 11 year old, and then as it grows up, it becomes darker. Mm. That, was, that was also kind of the intent I mean, from what I've heard. Still, yet, yeah, the first one is a little bit dark, too. You know, a kid lives under the stairs yeah. in a small cupboard. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, this is another thing that, you know, I was, a, I was kind of a scary cat as a kid. So that scene where, like, it, like, not like that where Voldemort in the forest is like attacking Harry. That scared the hell out mm. of me as a kid. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was something else I noticed too. These movies, especially some of the later ones, are so dark. Like not dark as in dark theme, but yeah. dark as in color. Oh wow! You know, I I don't remember what the review was even about, but it was something about you know 
that apparently the sequels need to be darker than the predecessors and then they <laughs> added in like brackets like if the if the if the creators of the next Harry Potter movie are going to tell us it's gonna be darker than the previous one we'll probably not be able to see anything because it'll be so dark I mean that is a bit of a problem in the later films though especially like this film has it a little the first film has a little bit but the later films especially it's so dark lighting wise so yeah. dark it almost got kind of annoying. Oh, like yeah, again, uh, it's it, it uh, just it, that's just me. Minutes. But like the lighting at times, it's like, what am I looking at? What, what was that? <laughs> oh my god! You know, imagine the people who like tried torrenting these movies in like cam quality. They won't be mm. able to see nothing. No, <laughs> maybe at all. Maybe that's what the idea. Stop pirating. Go see movies in theaters. You asshole. I After suppose. COVID is over. <laughs> um, oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Philosopher's Stone, what else? Or Sorcerer's Stone, as it should be known. No, 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 it's Philosopher's Stone. <laughs> Shut up. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that's actually one of the things. But that's another thing I like that, you know, again, it, I, I actually did talk about this, that, you know, it eases you into into the thing, into the rhythm of things, into this world, into this universe, into this everything. And it does it also does a good enough job of yeah. you know being a movie on its own and a book on its own that it's not just preparing you for the future like you know like a lot of other first of any kind is doing these days. So I appreciate it. Also I just want to say I know everyone loves Hermione but Many stone, she is a bitch. <laughs> I mean, she's definitely a know-it-all, but again, Hermione's my bookworm girl, and I love her. Yeah, no, no, I love Hermione too. That's not a mixed world tale, but in the first one, uh, she was annoying a bit. But then again, I understand it's part of her. It's part of her development that she's kind of a know-it-all that has no friends. But she grows to see the strength that, you know, the strength also comes from the people near you and not just from the books. So I like that. That's nice. Yeah, I'll also admit much, much, much younger Wolf back in the day did have yeah. a bit of a crush on the actress Emma Watson for Hermione. I think everyone did. <laughs> I mean, um, if you grew up on Harry Potter, you had a crush on Emma Watson. Even Daniel Radcliffe and Rupert Grint admitted that they had a crush on Emma Watson at some point. So I will, I will fully, I will be fully honest with that. I did have a bit of a crush on her when I was much younger. She is a great person, a great actress. Oh, you, you want to know something even more embarrassing? You want to know why I had a bit of a celebrity crush on her? She has the same birthday as I do. <laughs> That's it. That's all you need for HC. Just have the same birthday. Mm -hmm. I would say something about it, but yeah. <laughs> then I may regret it. But yeah, like, you know, Hermione and two other characters who we'll get to later. They're my girls, and I love them. Okay, we'll, we'll get to them later. But, uh, yeah, but uh, so if we are kind of done with the Philosopher's Stone and I, books... And yeah, something I do want to point out. Each uh, one of these movies, and there's six or seven. I think it's six. Um, Philosopher's Stone. Mean? Each one of these movies, like all six of them or seven of them, however many. I don't care at this point. <laughs> there's two movies. Movies, there, there are eight movies and seven books. Eight? How is there... Yeah. Deadly Hollows is split into two. There's seven. Yeah. Lost for seven books. You said eight. You said eight movies. And, and no, but but then, yeah, Deadly Hollows is split into two movies. Yeah, but you go Philosopher's Stone, Chamber of Secrets, Prisoner of Azkaban, Goblet yeah. of Fire, Order of Phoenix, mm -hmm. Deathly Hollows Part mm -hmm. One, Deathly Hollows Part Two. No. That's seven. Wells Half Wells Half Run Prince. You skipped oh. one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> And you skipped one of my favorites too. <laughs> kind of jumping the gun, but <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, okay, eight <laughs> movies. Um, still yet, each one of these movies are two hours long. Two and a half, even. 
some of them, but all of them are at least a little bit over two hours long. Not a single one is less than two hours. And good God, I think they could do with kind of pulling back a bit. All of them. I don't know what you would take away, but there's definitely, especially later movies, there's a few parts in Deathly Hallows that, good God, I could just do without. I do not care. But, Can we also talk about the fact that, you know, the, about uh, something that actually annoys me, and I should have said this earlier, that people, just because the movies cut some scenes from the books or change some stuff, doesn't mean they automatically see. I mean, being honest, if they tried to, if they tried to include the Hermione's duel, I think it's in, is it Chamber of Secrets that it is, I think, or is it Prisoner of Azkaban? It's the, her trying to free the house elves from, you know, house of that, That's actually Goblet, that's Goblet of Fire. That's... Goblet of Fire. If that was in the movies, I'm sorry, I would skip it so hard if it was in the movies, because yeah, Goblet of Fire is already two hours long, and there's already stuff I think they should take away from that movie. So, including I that, agree. as nice as it would be, and it, it might help Hermione's character and be good for her character, it would still just be too much, and I am glad that they at least cut that, because no, I think it was I just... Like, you know, no. if we're all already on this, jumping the gun a bit, although the Phoenix, my God, if, this, if they didn't cut anything from that damn book, I wouldn't even come near this this movie like my god but um yeah I, I think Philosopher's Stone going back to that we're jumping around a bit yeah Philosopher's Stone is a good entryway a good book a good entry book into I would say right that philo that you know H Harry Potter in general is a good entry to you know fiction but I wouldn't say it's the best fiction out there right and I think Philosopher's Stone kind of sets that up fairly well sets you up for this world these characters Decently well enough, and the movie does also. It, you know, mm -hmm. it's a fun, whimsical world that gets you into it and gets you enjoying it to then just tear you down later with sadness. Yeah. And uh, now it's the part of that you probably didn't expect we we're going to be talking about, but I'm going to talk about some, some of the Harry Potter games because I did play a lot of them. I played um, a, I think it was one of the I, it went through years like one through four or five or something maybe six then, like you, then you played probably the lego ones no i didn't i've no i've never played the lego ones i played it, this was on game boy advance this was like an rpg oh, sort of okay. thing okay. this was old old like it's i don't even have the game anymore i don't even remember what it was called i don't even know if you can find it anymore but that's the only game i've played maybe it was, it was like for the game boy advance Mm -hmm. So the thing is, I played the PC ones, and the thing is that for the first three games, uh, like uh, Philosopher Stone to Prison of Azkaban, is that the PC versions and the console versions were completely different. And, and, and you know, the PC version is kind of like a very simplified action-adventure game, which, and, but the console versions were more like Zelda with a Harry Potter skin. And and the thing about First of Stone is that there was a PS1 version which I've never played. I know fans consider it a good game, but I never got around to playing it. But uh, I played a PC one, which is... Uh, it's okay, it functions, I guess. And then there's the PS2 one. Because they decided to remake First of Stone to PS2, GameCube, and Xbox. After the Chamber of Secrets game was already out, what's the point? But they decided to do it anyway. Dear God, this game is garbage. <laughs> and yeah, that's my experience with the Philosopher Stone game. Um, okay, shall we move on? Sure. So, Chamber of Secrets. One of my favorites. Like, Harry Potter was kind of like the first four, last three for me. Uh, so, from the first fall, Chamber of Secrets is my favorite. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I enjoy Chamber of Secrets more than Philosopher's Stone, personally. I think Chamber of Secrets, you can kind of tell, like, they've grown into their own a bit more. Everyone's kind of gotten into the world, and they're, they have more of a budget, things like that. They're able to do quite a bit more. 
and they have also, more actors Dobby, coming in. Dobby, Dobby is the best. I love Dobby. I hate Dobby. <laughs> oh. At least in this film, like, at least parts of him. He's just annoying. I didn't like him in the book either, I'll be honest. It's just annoying. I don't know what you're talking about. He's adorable, and, and you know something? He's not I, bad I, in the he, movies, but I, he's not terrible in the movies. There are parts I enjoy him for, but in the books, I just felt like he was annoying. And in the movie, even then, I still kind of feel like, eh. eh. Actually, actually, though, but in in this in the movie, I, it's in the book too. But uh, the thing, but the thing about in the movie is that at the end, basically, no matter what you're going by, is that when Harry finds out that he's actually the servant of the Malfoys. Uh-huh. And this is and this is uh, Lucia, uh, Lucius, you know, beating Dobby up and stuff. And the way Harry actually tricks Lucius into, you know, freeing Dobby, and Lucius actually attempts to attack Harry because of this. And Dobby tells him, "You will not harm Harry Potter," and he blasts him off. That's so fucking satisfying. I love this scene. I so agree. Much. I agree. Again, there are good moments for Dobby, but it's just for the most part, I'm kind of. Eh, on him. I'll admit. Okay. That's fair, honestly. My but favorite character is the car. <laughs> fair point. Car saves the day. Car's awesome. Yeah. Also, it, it can fly. Idea. Yeah. And uh, that, that's actually something I really You know, the car just decides to arrive and save them from the Aragog. You know, it just happened to be there and, you know, help them out. That's, a, that's another thing I like, though, that you, you get to see more of Ron's family, and there are also, yeah. we start to see hints of Ginny's crush on Harry, which, you know, kind of sets up the, um, one, one, of the many, one of the many romances in this franchise, which we will get to. But, um, I do like seeing that we get to see more. We see more of Ron's family. We actually see a bit of Malfoy's family, and you know why he's such a trick. And also, my, and also, you know what's what is that? Lockout. Lockout is amazing. <laughs> yeah, he's we, fun. I like them. <laughs> and I, I like because you know I kind of I think I like the, the actor. Idea. I think the actor plays that character extremely well in the movie. That actor is also is also a director, and he was actually set. I think he was like set to direct one of the movies before they decided to just cast him as the as that character. I don't know the full story, hmm. but neat. Yeah. So I guess so. Chamber of Secrets. I will. I can talk about it for uh, for an hour, for hours, but we have a bit of a busy schedule here, so we should probably. Keep this moving, but uh, I, I do, I do love the, I do love, you know, the scene in Chamber of Secrets. You know, Harry fighting the Basilisk, and also, you know, the way that the Tom Riddle's diary like comes to life and how it's revealed that it's actually Voldemort at a younger age. I love all of this stuff. Just great. Like talk about, talk about an upgrade in the sequel. Fair enough. I, I mean, I think you know when you when you. <laughs> In the in the books, it's played a bit more with the anagram, like you know, Tom. What is it, Moldor? Nobody remembers. I don't remember. It's Tom. It. Well, I remember because it stuck out to me, or at least this did, and I thought it was funny. Tom Moldor Riddle, right, or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but it mm-hmm. stuck out to me, like in the books, right? That anagram plays out more longer, and it takes you longer to kind of figure it out. I suppose you could say. Because you're mm-hmm. reading it, not pronouncing it. In the yeah. movies, they pronounce you know his middle name very similar to how they would say Voldemort, and it's like y- you can instantly, instantly figure out. Oh, okay, that's Voldemort. It's just because mm-hmm. the way they pronounce it. It's like maybe they could have tried to hide that a bit better in the movie. I don't know. Maybe there's no way to do it, but just the way it's pronounced, it kind of gave it away in the movies a lot quicker than it did in the books. I feel. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's fair. You may be right. I again, I need to refresh on the book at one point. But yeah, Chamber of Secrets is great. I love it. Shall I think it was a three? really good sequel. 
Shall we move on to Prisoner of Azkaban? Sure. So one thing to <laughs> note about about you know kind of personal you know personal you know personal experiences with the with the, the movies and books is that when the Prison of Azkaban movie was like the next one to come out. Um, you may, everyone probably knows this. Richard Harris, who played Dumbledore in the first uh, two movies, passed away. Ah, and, I did not know this, actually. <laughs> oh, I'll be completely honest. The, I noticed he changed, but I was like, oh, I thought they recast him. I didn't know the original actor had died. No, so, so yeah, so the original actor died, sadly. He's no longer with us. And so there was a room, keep in mind, this was during the time where the internet wasn't a big thing and mm -hmm. you couldn't really look for stuff there. But so there was a rumor running around, uh, at least in my school, that they weren't making any more movies because of this. So I said, well, if they're not making any more movies, I should just stick to the books and read the books. So I got me the Prisoner of Azkaban book. Mm. And as soon as I got that book, Trailer started playing in theaters for the Prisoner of Azkaban movie, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, but also that was part of the fun though. That at the same time I got it, uh, two other friends of mine at the time got it too, and we were kind of having competition on who's gonna finish the book first before the movie, and then and then when the movie came out, we went to see it opening weekend. So that's like a personal fun moment I have with the uh, with Prisoner mm -hmm. of Azkaban. Mm. And, nice. and, as, and as it stands, like, as a book, I think this is the point where, you know, they, they kind of started having too much faith in Rowling because this is the, like, it's not a, it's not a problem much in, in this still, but you can tell The Prisoner of Azkaban is one of those movies where, uh, uh, books, sorry, where you could cut some stuff out. You could, uh, you didn't need to write all of this. So it kind of lowers it for me, but when I think, it comes to the, I think the movie's a great condensed movie, version, though. Yeah, and that's uh, that's not what I want to say. That I'm more in that I like the movie a lot more because I think it gets more to the point and cuts the fat. And that's saying Which, something for a two-hour movie that I still think maybe could cut a few things. I, no, I take that back. Right. Prisoner, there are some movies that I watched where I was like, all right, you know, that lasted as long as it needed to, and I don't feel anything kind of dragged. But there are later movies where, like, Goblet of Fire and Deathly Hallows Part 1, I believe? Probably 1. Yeah, 1. Just kind of drag in parts, and it's like, I don't care. <laughs> I just don't care about what's happening right now. I'm sorry. Specifically stuff to do with relationship issues, like Ron being an ass. I just don't care about it again. I don't. Um, okay, we'll get to this more when we get to it. But with, <laughs> uh, but with uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, one of the things that's interesting when you compare the book to the movie is that, is that you know, the... Um, what's his uh, You know, the... Book is like the last one that's like a bit more whimsical and you know lighthearted mm -hmm. from the books. So it's a couple of the fireworks stuff uh, becomes a bit more a bit darker. But in terms of the movies, the darker stuff already happens in Prison of Azkaban. Yeah. Which I personally I personally like this change. Besides the lighting, yeah, I agree. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's <laughs> Besides the lighting, even though, you know, as a film major, I really like the cinematography in Prison of Oscar. Well, I'm not saying the cinematography is bad. I'm saying that they could have brightened it up a bit. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> it's a bit too but... dark. <laughs> and we also get one of the greatest actors, Gary Oldman, to play Sirius Black. That's mm -hmm. great. But, yeah, I, speaking to the change in Dumbledore actors, right? I, I actually think it kind of works out. It's a little bit odd to have this kind of older, more slower Dumbledore to then go to this more fast-paced Dumbledore, because I think, like, who's the new actor for Dumbledore? I don't Pokemon? remember his name. Oh. I forget his name. We oh. should wiki it. But oh, okay. uh, uh, while you look it up, I will say, though, that the, both of them did have different portrayals of the character, though, and I think in Prison of Azkaban, they were still trying 
for the new actor to act like Richard Harris, which was the original. And I think that was a bad choice because, in, again, not as, not the new actor is bad. He's doing fine enough in the in all the other movies, but when you can tell he's trying to be that bit more wise, wiser and a bit more, you know, mischievous um, Dumbledore. You, it's not working because you can tell it's not the original. When he starts actually doing his own take in Goblet of Fire, that's where he actually starts to shine. Yes. Michael Gambon, I believe. Michael Gambon. There he is. Is the one who that. takes over. And yeah, I, I think I enjoy, I think when he starts doing the, you know, more fast-paced, more active Dumbledore, right? <laughs> the Dumbledore who definitely doesn't look like he's over 100 years old or definitely doesn't act like he's over 100 years old, you know, that kind of Dumbledore. <laughs> I I think he fits and works for the movies that come later because, you know, he's supposed to be this, you know, amazing, really all-powerful wizard, right? And in him doing that, you know, in him acting like that, you know, more active, younger Dumbledore, if you will, you know, quote-unquote, yeah. it's uh, it works a lot better for the later films. I think the slower Dumbledore that we got in the first two films, I don't feel he would have worked as well in, say, Goblet of Fire or... Order of the Phoenix, or Half Blood Prince. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually and that's actually something that I that I thought of though that <clears throat> in the books at the very least, Harry has this very angelic view of Dumbledore, like that he <laughs> thinks that he can do no wrong and that he's the face of all good. And I think you know, um, the actually Richard Harris portrayed it better. But I get I get what you mean. For the later movies, it it was probably a change for the best. I mean, again, we'll never been. know. You know, we'll never mm -hmm. really know per we'll se. We'll never know. Yeah. But I do think right that Richard Harris's Dumbledore may not have worked as well in those scenes. May not have. Mm -hmm. But yeah, either way you go, I think we got a good Dumbledore regardless, right? Mm-hmm. I think I both agree. actors brought something to the character and did a lot for the character and took it forward. I agree. Mm -hmm. So, um, so... Didn't we have... We well, no, that's later. Never mind. We'll get to it later. Later. Okay. So, so again, coming to, you know, what did I want to say? Um... Uh, so yeah, we are in Prison of Azkaban. I kind of said my thoughts on it. What, what are you thoughts about the book I mean, slash movie? I enjoyed it. I liked Sirius a lot. I think, you know, his, the actor who played him in the movie <clears throat> also, was great. Also, actually, something I forgot, uh, Lupin uh, in, is yes, probably my Lupin favorite. Lupin is also really fun and enjoyable. I like yeah, him a lot. Probably my favorite of the Defense Against the Dark Art teacher. I don't know. Moody was kind of fun, but we'll get to him. Mm. Yeah, but I'm saying who's my favorite is. Yeah, so... I think, like, as far as, you know, decent, good adults go, he's one of the better ones, yeah. I would agree. Mm -hmm. And also... Besides I Hagrid. Is... Yeah, besides... No, Hagrid is the best. Like, come on, Hagrid is the best. But, um, the... actually, that's something I, I was thinking of. That, um, you know, looking... I had a point that I wanted to say, and it escaped my mind. My God. Oh, yeah. That Prince of Azkaban, in my opinion, has one of the best mysteries in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the series. More, most likely because, you know, you are kind of like Black is actually out for how to get Harry, and that he did betray Harry's parents and stuff. And, but then all of a sudden, they, they, it kind of throws at you this brilliant twist that the person who actually betrayed Harry's parents was Scabbles, Ron's rat, who is actually Peter Pettigrew, who, who, who was the one who sold the Harry's parents to Voldemort. I actually really enjoyed that. Like, it actually kept you on your toes and actually figure everything out. It kind of makes sense in a bizarre way. I think, like, I think it makes better sense with the book, right? I think the book plays it off or plays it out a lot better than say the movie yeah, does. That's, that's I think true. the movie goes through it a bit too quickly. 
That's saying again, saying something for a two-hour movie. But yeah, I think the movie doesn't have it set up as well. I think the book okay. ha- does have it set up better, from what I remember. That doesn't mean the movie's bad. It just means that I, I think I get what you mean. a little bit more could have been done with it in the movie, maybe to try and mm-hmm. play it out more. Maybe I don't know. Maybe that's just me. But that's my opinion, yeah. right? I do think the book plays it out better than, say, the movie does. Mm-hmm. Actually, one change that, uh, you know, I kind of like compa- in, when they made in the movie than the book is that <coughs> in the book, in the book, Sirius sends Harry, you know, the the new broom, the firebolt, I think it's called. Yes. Um, he sends him that in the middle of the year. There is kind of a mini subplot about it being, uh, you know, tested to see if it's like, if it's like dangerous and, you know, how we got it. Uh, and it's, oh, uh, yeah, and in it's the book. Kind of yeah, the, that's a whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was this and that thing. And I actually really, I actually enjoyed the fact that he gets it at the end of the, at the end of the year and he gets it with one of uh, Buckbeak's, you know, feathers, which, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so, you know. It, it like signals, signals that this is from Sirius. I, I like that. Yeah, I think I, that was I a lot. That. I think that was a better choice. Yeah, I agree. Also, a uh, kind of a crossover idea. I want to, I want to draw at some point. Uh, Buckbeak meets Toothless from How to Train a Dragon. So Toothless is dead. Okay. No. <laughs> and also, Buckbeak doesn't die. They save him. I'm not saying Buckbeak does die. I'm saying Buckbeak would. Probably kill Toothless. That's a very fast conclusion to, conclusion to jump to, but whatever. I'll, I'll buy it, I guess. I mean, they definitely uh, wouldn't be friendly. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm joking. Plasma by the way. Blast. That's all I'll <laughs> say. I know, I know. So, yeah, but uh, Prisoner of Man, uh, again, a strong entry. I really like it. Um, and you know what? But one of the changes that kind of surprised me in the movie, in the movies, is that in the book we meet Cho Chang, for Harry's first love interest in the book, but she's not in the in the movie. She was kept for the next movie, which is Goblet of Fire. So quickly jump, you know, making a quick transition here. Mm-hmm. You said that Goblet of Fire, the movie at least, could have used a lot of cuts. And it's the romance stuff that I think could have been cut. The back and forth with Ron and Hermione. The back and forth with Harry and whoever. It's just... Pass. Pass. I don't care. I yeah, don't care. I, I mean... I get it. it you know, in this I one, think... it's not as bad, right? Because we've kind of been building up to it. And it's been set up somewhat. So, right? You know, so this is kind of... This is to some degree a bit of the culmination in some of these things. But then it's mm-hmm. like... Hey, here's Ron basically being a jackass the entire to a good, <laughs> during the ball during the gala and everything to Hermione completely being oblivious and not getting it, and it's just like, ugh, I get it, but uh, ugh. Actually, if we may talk about international so a bit, there's a point there's a point in the movie after the ball where Ron and Hermione fight. And I don't know who in the Hebrew dubbing process made this decision. But there's a point where, you know, Ron yells at Hermione. Something. Like, he argues with her, like, how dare you go out with Crumb? He's the competition and everything. And Hermione's reaction is calling Ron a pot. I don't know why. It's, when I first saw that dub, I, just, I couldn't stop laughing at it. It was great. <laughs> like, this is not the reaction I expected out of her, but whatever. Fine, random thing. So, yeah, Gun with the Fire. Um, personally, this is the point where, again, like if Prisoner of Azkaban started to feel like this, the book could have cut a lot. Out of yeah. that. I'm looking at the Hermione's uh, house of thingy that, again, this is one of those things where people say, how dare they not put it? It's like, really? This is this is what you're going to sleep over. I mean, to be honest, right? I was watching these movies. And I was like, "Where's the house elf thing? Wasn't that a thing? Where's that at? <laughs> is it in this film? No. This film? No. This film? No. 
Is it in any of these films? I swear that was a thing. Am I just completely losing my mind? <laughs> and I had to go. I, I genuinely look at it and looked at it. I was like, "Oh, it's not there." Okay, because I swore it was a thing, and I was like, "That's definitely a thing in the books, right?" Right? Yes, it was. And yeah, I remember reading the book. If I'm if I'm recalling the memory correctly, I remember reading the book. And whenever we would get to the house elf thing, I would kind of glaze. My my eyes would definitely kind of glaze over, and it's like, okay, okay. Yeah, honestly. Honestly, that's some plot. But put me I out, want put me out to bring book. this up, right? And I think mm -hmm. I can bring it up now at this point. Yeah. How do I phrase this without making a lot of people mad? I actually, you know, I, I agree with Hermione, right? That, you know, they should be freed and all that stuff. But everyone's just a dick to Hermione. <laughs> I'm sorry. They're just absolute <laughs> yeah, yeah, assholes that, to this poor girl, like, especially in the like, in this book. Because I think you know, if I recall this correctly, Harry and, Ron, Harry and Ron just kind of join her because you know because she's their friend. Then they kind of feel sorry for her, but it's not like they actually care. And it's like that's not the that's not the I way. I want to bring this it. up too, right? The Harry Potter series, right? Like, we have our hero character who's supposed to save the world. He's the chosen one, but he doesn't do anything. Yeah, he saves Actually, the world, but... I I did want to say something in regards to Prisoner of Azkaban, so I'm going back a bit. Okay, go ahead. The, the, I'll like hold. That, yeah, but uh, the thing about um, this, that so one of the main criticisms <laughs> about the... Uh, the books and the movies in general is that Hermione usually does most of the, most of the job, and Harry is kind of like pointless. People say, "I think Prisoner of Azkaban is the one that you know what Harry actually knows a bit more about defense against the town cults, and there's a bit more of the other thing of Hermione that he can actually control a Patronus, and this is something that actually kind of carries over to the rest of the thing that." He does. He does have a better control of his Patronus over Hermione. So this is something. There are some things to his credit. He's not completely useless. He's just. But the, I, I, I think people are just kind of. Hermione's Patronus is an otter, though, so automatically cooler. Mm -hmm. uh, it's. <laughs> you know, I actually have a friend who is on. Like, nickname is Otter. If you're watching this, dude, this was for you, I guess. <laughs> but. Uh, but, it, but I want to be clear, right? I don't think Harry is useless, but I think the story of Harry Potter, right? And having went back through the movies now, I think it, it stands out a lot more obviously to me than it did way back in the day, is that Harry kind of just fights for the status quo, but he never changes anything. Mm -hmm. Like, by the time you get to the end of the series, book or movie... Nothing really yeah. changes. Like, yeah, sure, we beat Voldemort, we save the wizarding world, but there's so much shit wrong with the wizarding world that is just absolutely a, terrible and needs to change, but our main hero character point. doesn't care. Like, mm -hmm. the house self thing is such a great point. You have the one character who wants to enact good change, and our hero is just like, yeah, sure, you're my friend, I feel sorry for you, I support your cause, kind of whatever. Like that's how it comes off a lot of the time, if I'm not mistaken. The thing I'm is, calling correctly. Yeah, you kind of right, but at the same time, you know, you know, fighting for the ourselves is kind of like, you know, it's kind of like in the real world, sadly, where this is kind of those fights that will never end. And but it can okay. though. People would give a shit, you know. Yeah, that, but that's exactly the point. People don't give a shit, and they, but you I know, think as it's much a I, problem. Wait, wait. Yeah, wait. Go ahead. Um, I, th I think, though, that, you know, <laughs> kind of like one person can change all the assholes that live in the world, in the oh, real sure. world. Harry can, you know, Harry can beat Voldemort as much as he wants. He can't really change the fact that dick-headed people are still around. I absolutely and... agree with you. With that said, not looking at the narrative sense, looking at the meta-narrative sense, in, as in J.K. Rowling writing these books and the movies in general, I think it sets a bad example, personally, to have a hero character who basically says the status quo is okay, even though you can clearly see the status quo isn't okay, that things need to change. 
I think having an entire story developed around the idea he saved the world, he doesn't have to change anything, he did his part, is not that great. I think, mm-hmm. right, now, I don't think this means Harry Potter is bad by any means. This is just my personal yeah, opinion. I want to be clear with our you know, viewers. You can, yeah, you can, you can criticize stuff you like. It's okay. But I, I do think, right, that there is better fiction out there. I think Harry Potter was a great gateway for me into the idea of fiction and into the idea of what one can do with writing and how one can enjoy writing and enjoy reading as well and have a lot of fun with it. But I don't think it's the best story I've ever read, right? I think I have read much better that does so much more with its story, with its world, with its characters. I think Harry Potter does in some ways play it safe. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's this definite, we saved the world, that's all we need to do. We don't need to do anything more than save the world. And having seen fiction that has gone beyond that, I think there's a lot more you can do with that. And I think we owe it to try and explore those ideas. And Harry Potter doesn't. And in that way, it falls flat for me somewhat. And I enjoy it a little bit less. And going back to it now, I can much more clearly see that than when I was younger. Okay, that's fair. <clears throat> and that is a good point. But uh, back to Goblet of Fire. <laughs> Again, we were talking about the house of thing uh, <clears throat> you want to say. Or did you kind of... I mean, I'm kind of <laughs> glad it wasn't in the movie, I'll be honest. Okay. I, I know okay. I, the speech I just gave about, you know... <laughs> Wanting to change things and then say, yeah, I'm kind of glad the whole, the one thing that was about changing the wizarding world wasn't in the movie. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Never said I wasn't a hypocrite, but I just, looking at the Goblet of Fire movie, specifically the movie we got, I just don't know if there's a way they can fit the house elf thing in there and make it, one, work, and two, feel like it just doesn't drag. Because again, Mm -hmm. as I said, I do feel Goblet of Fire already has moments within this movie that just kind of drag. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, um, I, one thing I want to say about Egg uh, is, is that, you know, in terms of changes from the book, there is, uh, there is one that, you know, it's not a big thing. And honestly, you know, and, you know, this is really nitpicky. And I'm not saying it's a problem or anything, but I just found it weird. And that, you know, there's the Tri Wizard tour- Tournament in that book slash movie and you know the and the thing is that in the book both uh, you know both schools are are kind of like you know are you know are presented as regular schools and you know both of them have girls and boys studying it but then the movie kind of makes this, this change that you know one school is girls only and the other is boys only and I don't know, something about it felt, again, it's nothing big, but at the same time, it kind of made me raise an eyebrow. Eh? Okay. Sure. Whatever you say. Is this making yep. sense? Or am I no, I, I get you. Like, <laughs> I think Goblet of Fire, like rewatching these movies, Goblet of Fire was the point where I realized these movies are very traditionalist. And also the books as well, like they're very traditionalist, if you will, right? There's a lot of traditionalism within them that sets in there that it's like, eh. <clears throat> it, it, Actually, it, it, if you get what I mean by that, right? If you get what I mean by that, right? It's it it makes Kinda. it. It it makes it stand out a lot more going back to them now as an old you know being older and recognizing these things and recognizing those more traditionalist values, right? And understanding what they are and what they're like. Going back and watching some of the older movies now and seeing them through, you can kind of see a lot of that traditionalism stand out a lot more. And it's like, I don't like it. (laughs) Fair enough. It's not, it doesn't make the movies terrible, but it definitely makes them stand out a lot more as sticking points that kind of drag, that again, kind of drag a little bit. And you can kind of see like, it makes them stand as products of their time more, I feel, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get what you mean. Um, on that note, uh, something actually funny about Goblet of Fire that has, um, that has nothing to do with the movie itself. I just uh, really enjoyed that story. 
and that you know my uncle he, he's an old man he <laughs> like but he does enjoy you know fantasy stuff and you know anime and stuff and everything so this and this was the point where you know the deadly house the book was about to come out mm-hmm. and it was also the same time that the order of the phoenix movie was coming out so everyone like Harry Potter was everywhere, and my uncle like one day just uh, chain you know zip through TV channels and saw that Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire is on one channel. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna see what Harry Potter is about. I'm gonna see. But the thing is that he didn't see that this was like kind of halfway through the movie. So ah. he changes. So he changes. So he goes to the channel, and the first thing he sees was. The dragon scene where the dragon chasing Harry. And it's like, imagine if you're going into Harry Potter with no knowledge, what, no idea what it's about, you have no idea what anything, and this is the first thing you see <laughs> a dragon chasing a um, 14 year old on a broom. Like, I mean, I would definitely be interested. <laughs> but, but again just the fact that this at the time 60 year old something decided to see what Harry Potter is about and this was what he was greeted with yeah, I don't know I found, I found that fun it could have been worse it could have been the Ron and Hermione arguing scene for the 50th time uh, yeah could yeah, very much true very much true <laughs> but you know say what you want about Goblet of Fire the one thing I really like about it, especially in the movie sense, is that, you know, Voldemort has been built up throughout the first, I guess you could say all the first four books and movies. Mm. As the, and, the, and, you know, that's a really huge thing to live up to, uh, especially, when, especially, you know, when it's your first introduction. But I think they did, both in the book and the, and the movies, they did Voldemort. Coming, coming back scene wonderfully. Yeah, like, I would agree. Like, I love the scene in the movie where, you know, Voldemort explains how he couldn't touch Harry when he was a baby. And mm-hmm. then he said, but now that the, but the same blood uh, runs through their veins again, uh, now he can, and he does this, I can touch him. This is so creepy and uncomfortable. And yeah. it's like, and it's like, Mm, that's all good. <laughs> yeah, the actor for Voldemort does extremely well, I think. Ralph Fiennes, yeah. Great actor. Mm-hmm. And now from the things I like about God of Fire 2, one thing I really hate about it, the video game. My god, the God of Fire 3 <laughs> video game is terrible, 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 terrible. Good Fuck to know. that game. Fuck that game. Good to I know. am... I'm not joking. This is one of the worst games I've ever played in my That's all I have to say. (laughs) (laughs) I can go on about it. No, I would rather you didn't. I would rather you didn't. Um, uh, Yeah, again, like I I enjoyed the film. It was, you know, that was my recatcher. Actually, you said uh, said Moody is uh, really like Moody, so might as well bring him up. Do what now? You said you really like Moody, so. Was he? Oh, yes, he was in this one, yeah. Um, I enjoy him. I know you, you know, he's a fake Moody, but I still enjoy yeah. the fake Moody, right? Like, especially in the movie, he's a really fun character, and uh, I mean, he plays himself really well. And I had forgotten entirely that David Tennant was in this movie too. Oh yeah, he's uh, Betty Crouch Jr. Yes, very underused, unfortunately. Yeah, underused, but you know, for was this what before he has, or after Doctor Who that made him really popular? I think before. I think it was before. Ah. I'm not sure. But you know, it's still great to see him there, honestly. <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree. I think know, it works. Seeing him in other stuff, you know, I don't watch Doctor Who, but you know, seeing him in, like stuff like Jessica Jones and Good Omens and others and DuckTales <laughs> and stuff, and all of a sudden see him in this, it's all, oh my God. <laughs> the, mm-hmm. Like the good old days before we got popular. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I think, right, for me, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed. <clears throat> seen, you know, fake Moody come in and show the class the different uh, deadly three deadly curses and four. playing around. I, I, oh, no, no, it's three. It's three. Three, Sorry. four it's deadly three. curses. There's a lot of them. There's some of them. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like seeing him teach the class and just, you know, he's a very fun character, right? Like he's enjoyable mm-hmm. to watch on screen, I think. I like how they did his eye 
in the movie. Mm. And, and I love his little, you know, Harry's getting ready to go through the maze. And you know he wants Harry to get through the maze because he wants to kill Harry, but still yet, yeah. you know, I love the little turnaround, just kind of point, like, go that way. Like, I love that he just, you know, completely doesn't care about the rules. And you know, right, that regular Moody would also be like this. Even though this is fake yes. Moody, you know, regular Moody would also just kind of flout the rules and not care at all either. And I do kind of enjoy that character. So, all the, all the Phoenix? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess I don't think there's too much more to say about you know, Goblet of Fire. It's an enjoyable so, film. Yeah. So, all the, all the Phoenix, you know, when people say, oh, the movies don't follow the books to a T, this, this is the book I'm pointing at and saying, and, and I'm just saying, really? Because... <clears throat> I'll be honest here, the Order of the Phoenix book, I don't think it's good. It drags so, so much. From this and point I, forward, right, it's worth me pointing out, I have only seen the movies for Order of the Phoenix, Half-Blood Prince, and Deathly Hallows. I have not read okay. those three books. So I have uh, more stuff to say on the books then. Yes, but, uh, this is all you. So, <laughs> so regarding the books, I'm sorry, all is not a good book like it, it has decent ideas it has an interesting premise but the book itself drag and not surprising considering the movie also drags and, and that's and you know that's actually something that i think the movie did did you know because i think a reviewer put it best i remember reading this came out the movie needs to cram a book that's the size of a wall into two and a half hours. So you can you obviously. I mean, I give it credit, but it still feels like it drags in some places again because by Goblet of Fire, you know, we've had the Ron and Hermione arguing thing, and we've seen them kind of get together, and yet we still do it in Order of the Phoenix. We still do it in fucking. Half Blood Friends. We still do it in Deathly Fucking Hallows, and it's just like I don't care anymore. <laughs> uh, it's like, so, why are these uh, two together? Why does J.K. Rowling think these two would be good for one another? Because they are that's not. That's actually that's actually something that uh, she apparently later regretted, and she said she should have had made a funny fuck with Harry, which I honestly don't. I don't for. think they're good either. None of them are good <laughs> for one another. They're all terrible for yeah. one another as can far as relationships be, you know, go. Can, you know, can they just be friends? You can be good I will say friends this. for life. Right? Harry and Hermione have a bit more chemistry in the movie, I feel, but I've not, uh, again, I take that back. I've not read the later books, so maybe that changes in the later books. Maybe they have better chemistry in the later books. But there's just consistently this thing of. I, I feel like they just kind of take Hermione for granted, you know, as characters a lot of the time. And it's just like, they might be okay friends, but neither of these two dudes are good for her for a relationship, I feel like. They're all just kind of terrible. Maybe they can become better, and I'm not saying they can't, but eh, I just, eh, I just don't care. I just don't uh, care. That's just me. Maybe other people do. Just, if so, do just, great, have fun, but eh. I don't even care about Harry and Ginny either, and that's just such a small thing in the movies. It's just like, oh yeah, they're they're in a relationship together, aren't they? It's get a bit more a bit more uh, developed books, but nah, nah, nah. <laughs> but uh, let's let's just say romance isn't the strong suit of any of the photo um, media, and leave it at that. Order of the but... Phoenix is when we see Luna, right? Yes. Favorite character. Love Luna. I won't say favorite, but you know, actually, Riv is... Oh, yeah. Maybe not favorite, but I still love her. She's great. She's my girl. Her and Hermione yeah. are my girls. I love them. Ginny's not I terrible, would... but she just doesn't get a lot of screen time, unfortunately, so... That's actually something I... One thing I will is that, you know, um, in the last year, I've um, I've met a, I met a girl who became a really good friend of mine, and she actually really reminds me of Luna and so places so shout out to her if you're listening to this then you're great um, because you're like luna you're awesome i like luna <laughs> she's great okay i won't mention names but uh yeah if you're listening to this you're awesome anyway but the, you know, in bringing that up though it, there, there is a lot of 
interaction between I, I really think, you know, considering Ginny's supposed to be in a relationship with Harry, the movies really don't give them a lot of scenes together to remind you like Honestly, hey, the, she the exists. Book, the books don't do this. I'm not surprised. I'm, but... I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> But there is actually something kind of interesting to point about us when have bug points. But uh, although the Phoenix, so mm-hmm. like I said, although the Phoenix as a book, I don't like it. It has too much stuff. Now the thing, the reason I will say the movie better is because it's condensing some of the stuff and it actually you know focuses on things. But at the same time, you can tell that they kind of bring up some points in other in the movie that don't really go anywhere, like. They point out the owl exams, which, uh, you know, are kind of like final, uh, you know, kind of the big finals in the, in the home thing. Mm-hmm. So, that, uh, so they bring this up in the movie and it's a bigger thing in the book that because you actually see them also going through the exam and everything. But at the same time, it kind of, they bring this up in the movie and then they just, so at the same time, why make a big deal? out of these owls in the movie like why bring this up at all if you're going to cut a plot line cut a plot line you know i mean i think it 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 works for what it is since it's kind of background and it gives fred and george's character one big last hurrah which was nice because you definitely see a lot more from them in this film and i guess the book oh no i'm not i'm not talking about uh, fred and george i'm just uh, talking about you know the owls in general you know they, you know, because Fred and George could have pulled that one, uh, that one big of stunt, you know, literally at any other point in the, you know, it could have been just a regular example. They didn't need to build up the fact that they always <laughs> even exist. Fair. But, Fair. And then there are, the, like, there are kind of the, there are, but the things that I did, like, in the book, that build up the, you know, oh, Voldemort's back, and there's the entire thing of, does the world even want to acknowledge that he's bad? Yeah. Like, I, I, I do kind of like this angle that, you know, there's, that not everyone just immediately assumes that he's back because honestly, are you going to trust a 15-year-old world on this? And then, and then there's also the inter- Um, Harry being an annoying prick is also one. I don't like in all of the like I get what they are going for is the hormonal teen that you know wants to that you know that that is kind of being kept in the dark about issue he feels he should know about, but at the same time, man is Harry not a likable character in this book. The movie a bit more, but yeah, I think I, it's interesting that you like the angle they took with the whole world not wanting to acknowledge Voldemort's existence, but coming from just the movie on this one, I don't think they did it that well, and I could have just done without it. It was kind of annoying, and a lot of Harry, Harry's, you know, kind of, again, like, they did it okay, you get it, but it's just kind of like, eh... Eh. So, and <laughs> even the stuff with Dolores Umbridge, I just eh. Well, Umbridge, like Umbridge is terrible. Okay. I get and she's terrible. Ter- I get people hate her. I just don't care. Mm. Okay. I think there are more interesting things personally, but we don't get to see those actually, because actually, Umbridge. If, uh, someone did, someone did uh, wrote, apparently, you know. We, I would have never figured it out that Dolores was basically rolling insulting herself in the story. <laughs> did not know that. No, she didn't actually do it. Considering all the stuff she's been saying and stuff, so people will see her as Umbridge because she, ah. because she, you, you get what I mean? I get you now, yes. Okay. I completely get you now, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well deserved. But, uh, mm-hmm. So, uh, and another thing that, but then again, there are some stuff they kept in the movie. There. Like Hagrid's uh, big brother, why was he needed? Why was this needed? Yeah, I that, don't know. I mean, it, it, it's literally we're introduced, and then we just get one scene of it in the background where, you know, it, it's it, at least in the movie, like you know, he's introduced, and then it's like 
he basically stops Umbridge from killing them and or torturing them, and that's it. It's that's all he's there for. You never see him ever. Does he even pop up in the books ever again? Like, is he even in the final <laughs> battle for the books? If he is, then I don't remember. See, what's the point in <laughs> it? Then? Is kind of, why does Hagrid why does... need a half brother? Who gives a shit if he's never gonna like? Even in the movie, you don't see him. If he's there, I completely missed him. Like, not there for the final battle, nothing. He's just gone after this one scene of him, you know, stopping Umbridge, and that's it. And, and the, 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 um, the centaurs as well. Like, what's the point? Yeah. Like, yeah, sure, they take Umbridge and they don't they kill do her. stuff to her, I guess. Nothing happens to her. She just ends up in Azkaban, and then you see her later. She's free, and she gets one scene, and or, you know, one little scene, and that's it. And it's just like, what's the point? And the centaur is being mad if she's still alive. If they're going to take her and she's still alive, who cares? Uh, and like, again, why are I the centaurs a, there? And I think that's again the point that, you know, and that, you know, I say are, stuff about, you is know. Is the centaurs the, the, like more of a thing in the book or? Fuck if I know, dude. I don't remember. <laughs> so, I mean, why not dedicate one of those two things? Like, you already had this main centaur character you introduced way back in the first film. Instead of having Hagrid have a half brother who has to be in that scene, why not use that main centaur character who saves them and the centaurs take her? At least that would have been more cohesive and would have brought back an old character. And that's, or just and that's not exactly have the, the centaurs there and just have it be focused on Hagrid's half brother and he just takes Dolores and runs off. Who knows? Who cares? <laughs> and Either that's way. Exactly, and that's another thing that, again, <clears> I'm pointing out when I say that it's good that the movie is condensing some stuff. At the same time, I don't think they condensed enough. Like, if, like you know, again, they mentioned the owls. That's not going anywhere. We have Hagrid's half brother. That's not really going anywhere. Um. So again, and it feels like they. Kind I of think it would have been. And better. it feels like they kind of just mentioned these things because they happened in the book, and we kind of have mm-hmm. a contractual I obligation to. I think it would have been better. Because you have Hagrid mention that, you know, the Ministry is encroaching on the Senator's territory, right? And they're angry about that. I mm-hmm. think it would have been better if you would have focused on the Centaurs and just Hagrid, who cares about Hagrid's half-brother, doesn't exist, doesn't matter, that's not a thing. Just focus on the Centaurs, bring back that original Centaur character who we had, have him say, you know, have him meet them in the forest. And then, you know, it's him and the Centaurs that save them from Dolores later, right? <clears throat> you have it. That way it's yeah. more focused, it adds to the world building more, and it just does more. Instead of us having to have the centaurs, that little bit of small world building that goes nowhere, and then Hagrid's half-brother, that little bit of character building, and this brand new character who also goes nowhere. Both of these things go nowhere. And by the end of it all, I do not care about um. either the centaurs and their plight, because I have no familiarity with it whatsoever and no connection, and I don't care about Hagrid and his half brother because who knows where he fucks off to? Mm-hmm. Like, and, you know, um, it, it's he's the car, but the car was fucking cooler than Hagrid's half brother because at least the car <laughs> did something other than just kind of pick someone up, drop them, and then run away. The car saved people's lives. The car was actually a more interesting character than Hagrid's half brother. And that shouldn't be that way because that's Hagrid's half brother. What the hell? Okay, stopping you on the rant here for because the one thing everyone will say to his defense three is that the fell the last twenty to thirty minutes, you know, when we get to the fire to the big to the big battle in the Ministry of Magic, that's cool. That I, that I enjoyed. Sure, that's great. That's some amazing effect work, by the way. Like Dumbledore and Dumbledore versus, you know, Voldemort. Voldemort. That was great. Yeah. That was some great effect work right there. That was a great fight to see. The fight of them, you know, fighting everyone in the, you know, hall of, in the Chamber of Prophecies or Hall of Prophecies, whatever you want to call it, the yeah. Room of Prophecies. That, yes. that was cool, seeing all the prophecies get destroyed. You absolute dicks. Like all those other prophecies. <laughs> just gone now. Wow. Yeah. Well, because save the world with all that shit now. Who now? What are we gonna do? Wolf. They are not. Uh, <clears throat> they don't need to kill Voldemort. Yeah. Uh, 
other Dark Lord comes. Like, oh shit, wish we had that prophecy about this other new Dark Lord we had to deal with, but we don't now. Well, we're fucked. <laughs> what can you do, I guess? <laughs> but um, basically, what did I want to say? So, but, you know, we have this fight, which again, amazing fight. And, um, but, you know, getting to that fight. I guess I get the symbolism this, for the prophecy, destroying all the other prophecies as well. I guess I get the symbolism, but it's just kind of dumb. It's just one of those symbolism, do you get it kind of things. Oh, hit the mic. I'm sorry, audience or listeners. <laughs> yeah, still, I, 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 <clears throat> that's how excited it makes me. That's how upset it makes me that I'm hitting my mic. I just, I get the symbolism, but it's just, it's just, duh, it's just dumb. It's just dumb. It's just, it's all dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. Calm it's down. <laughs> I, <laughs> calm down, dude. I, until you come down, I... Go I ahead. Know. I'm good. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> Listen, I've had worse rants than this. I've had yeah. way worse rants than this. Yeah, you did. But uh, anyway, but back uh, thing about, you know, in the book movie. Uh, one thing I like is that, you know, I know you don't, you don't really care about relationships. But um, the thing is that in the book, Harry and Cho just kind of just kind of like break up with no real reason you know it, it's a just... we tried it didn't work but uh, in the movie they to the fact that she gives away Voldemort and I honestly like this change. yeah but That's she what... does it it's such a shit thing though because then you find out later like she was you know forced into doing it because she was literally tortured or she was given you know a truth serum and it's like it wasn't even her fault but it's like no one apologizes to her for that they all just treat her like dirt and it's like eh it's like oh you were forced to tell the truth eh move on yeah like, wow you absolute uh, dicks i guess i fulfilled the idea <clears throat> i get it still dicks <laughs> again no one in this movie is a good person <laughs> And, no, again, no one in this probably, series, this story, these this is, these stories are, are good people. And that, I think that's actually that Harry Potter, you know, the main guy, is annoying because he's a dick in this book slash movie. And I, I get why he would be mad. I would have been mad too, but at the same time, at no point this kid really stops to think. And he just, and you know, he just kind of believes that, you know, just because Voldemort tr tried to kill him and <laughs> failed, he kind of takes this responsibility upon himself to know everything about him. Even you have adults that can take care of this, and they have fought him before. So just, you know, just listen, basically. I guess, right, the thing to note is that. <clears throat> You have this entire set, you know, you, you have Sirius, right, come and at some point and tell Harry, you know, it's not about, you know, there's good and evil or light and dark and all people, right? Not everyone is completely good or not everyone is completely evil, right? Basically foreshadowing the fact that his father was kind of an ass as well. Yeah, you know, Bellatrix. Yeah, this is true. It's, you know, you have all of this and it's like, I think the entire point of not all of all of the characters being dicks at point it points is to show that you know everyone can be good and everyone can be bad, and it's like, yeah, but everyone can be better, and you know none of these kids, except barring maybe one or two, look at their parents and say, you know what, you are kind of a dick. I'm gonna be better than you. Again, Harry Harry at least has the excuse of he doesn't know until a certain point, but then he eventually finds out that his father was a bit of a dick, but it's like... Yeah, he actually found out in this book. Ah. He, Still, he, yeah. Like, tried and, like, ah, yeah, from Snape, that's Snape. right. Yeah. yeah. But still yet, you know, you, you he doesn't change, right? He doesn't say, oh, wow, okay, maybe I should do and be better than what my dick of a dad was. No, I'm still going to be a bit of a dick, too. In the later films, I'm in the later stories. You know, I'm not gonna much change really, and be a better person. Yeah. We're just all gonna say I'm a better person than Voldemort, and that's just enough. And it's it's again, it's not enough. And that's why I come back to that thing of these books, effectively 
fight for the status quo for things to kind of remain the same like maybe you change a little bit maybe you try and do a little bit better but you know you don't have to it's okay if you don't and it's like no it's not it's <laughs> not at all be better don't be dicks if you're going to be dicks why do i care about you why do i want to support you why do i want to even remotely stand for you i don't short short answer you don't <clears throat> so you know this is why only characters i like hermione and luna luna's just you know adorably sweet and hermione actually changes and she actually gets better you know she you you see her in that first film and she's definitely a know-it-all and smug and prideful and you see her go on and yes yeah, she still has a bit of that pride and smugness but she does get better about it she does actively change the other characters don't really change like even in Deathly Hallows, you still have Ron being an absolute fucking ass towards Hermione for no good reason. Like, like, oh, look at Harry and Hermione trying to have a relationship without me now. It's like, you fucking idiot. Uh, well, that's, that's kind of explained. <laughs> but, uh, I get what you're I, God. This is Wolf shitting on Harry Potter hour. And no one's gonna <laughs> yeah, like it. We're gonna get a lot of angry comments and letters and, later. And I will. I like how and I will hear from it and I will tell which you do. I didn't uh, shit on it earlier. I've yeah. only started shitting on it now. Like, again, again, you can criticize stuff you like. Just because we have criticism about Harry Potter doesn't I love Harry Potter. I like it just because I have some Oh no, I hate Harry Potter now. <laughs> I mean, that's yes, that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. Get off. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, uh, Order of the Phoenix, I think we're done. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, no, no, no. You know, just kind of a funny thing. This is where we meet my girl Tonks. That's the only thing I like about this movie. Yeah. Tonks also. And, Hermione, and Luna. Luna, Luna, Tonks. Those are my girls. Ginny okay. also. Guess, we uh, need to see more of her, but still yet. Those are my four girls. I love them. Yeah, but uh, so I just want and to Neville. That, uh, Neville's good too. He's my guy. Neville, yeah, Neville's also fun. But uh, the thing is that, and I assume you don't care about how hard you got. Right. You're breaking up somewhat. You want to repeat that? Oh, am I okay now? Maybe. You want to just repeat uh, it? And we'll see. <laughs> I just, I just said that you know I'm assuming people that nope, you broke that up care again. about. Ah, for the love of God. Give me a second. <laughs> While we're waiting on him, let's talk about how bad Harry Potter is again, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> he is back. We'll give him a minute. If you're talking, HC, I definitely can't hear you. Just to let you know if you can't hear me. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. And you're not breaking okay, up, it seems good. like, so we should be good. Okay, so what I want to <laughs> say, I, I'll drop the joke that I had. But um, <laughs> the thing is, the thing about when, although the things the movie came out, this was around the time that, you know, IMAX theaters started making the rounds, and we had exactly one IMAX theater in, in my local theater. And you know, this was a, also a long time that 3D movies weren't coming out every few years, every few months. So yeah. there was a big thing, there was a big thing about this that, you know, there's a new IMAX theater and you know, the new Harry Potter movies playing on it. And in the last 20 minutes, you're literally inside the film and everything. And, I, and then uh, so my cousin and some of our friends uh, went to see it. And the thing they didn't expect was that when they went in near the end of the screen, like right where all the 3D stuff was about to go on and you were supposed to be inside the movie and everything, right when it was supposed to happen, the projector uh, broke. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, you know, they were so bummed and they were like, I tried to ask for a refund, but what they did, they moved them to a, to a regular screen of the movie in a different in a different theater so like as soon as they were almost done watching the movies they had to go to another theater and watch the entire thing from the start huh. just just to catch up wow 
then so that was a thing. <laughs> but anyway, half blood friends. Uh, in terms of the books, this is honestly one of my favorites. And in I can terms see of why. The, Looking at the movie, at least I can see why. Yeah, but and here's the thing though: that even though I really enjoyed the book, the movie, everyone was like really hyped for this one. Like the reception was insane, and even Rowling kind of says that this is one of her favorites from the adaptations. But I'm uh, I, like I don't I don't hate the movie by any means. I mean, I do think it's a good movie, but. I think I they could have done know. better and more with Malfoy. I think Malfoy, you know, because you know, considering what his character is going through within, I'm guessing they expand. It's expanded on more in the books, but I don't think the movie does enough with his character. Right? There's there's definitely more in the book about him trying to become a death eater. I think you know, the movie could have done a bit more about his you know plight and what he's going through and everything like that. It's very kind of ambiguous and I feel like if you've not read the book you're not really going to get a lot from it right at least from the movie at least in regards to the, just watching the movie so I think yeah. they maybe could have done better another thing point. that's kind of like that's more in the book and not in the movie which is a pretty very big problem considering the name is that the half blood drinks plot is very very much underdeveloped like because in the book in the book, like you can see more of how how much Harry learns from the Half Blood Prince ah. and how much it, and how much it actually affects him. Mm-hmm. In the movie, it's like in the movie, it's like wow, this book really works. It's like Harry, this book is dangerous. Get rid of it. And then all of a sudden, at the end, it's like I'm the Half Blood Prince. Okay. Well, I mean, <laughs> in the movie, you kind of have the progression of, or at least the the sense you're given in the movie is like, oh, the book helped him out with potions. Oh, the book gave him this spell that he uses on Malfoy and almost kills Malfoy and then all right the book's too dangerous we got to get rid of it and it's like his character never seemed to change reading the book right his character seemed to all st- his character seemed to pretty much be the same throughout the entire movie until the point that he kills Malfoy and he's like okay we need to get rid of the book and that's it yeah, and like that, the only other that, instance yeah. you're given is like you know the character's talking about how he sleeps with the book and he never lets it out of sight or lets it go or anything and it's like and here's the thing okay. that in the in the in the book we see this stuff we actually see it and um, not and not only that not only that, that we see it he actually kind of has an argument over it that you know <laughs> Hermione is kind of pissed about this about the idea that Harry suddenly is better than, than, Harry, than Harry Potions because of that book. And and then he actually has kind of an argument with him. God damn. <laughs> what was that? You didn't hear that. Nothing. I dropped something. It's all right. <laughs> so, uh, Don't worry about they kind, it. They, they kind of have an argument about it that, you know, Harry is like, oh, you have problems with someone being better than you and stuff. And it's like, there's more to the to the story of this book, and actually, and you know, again, talking about the games for it, about the game for a bit. There's one of the things I like about the book yeah, is that you know when uh, Harry uses that curse on uh, Draco, that almost kills them. Um, so there's this thing that for one, um, Molly Mel- Meltal sees this, and she's the one that calls Snape to the sea. And when Snape shows up, he like asks uh, Harry to see his, um, you know, his potion oh. book. Oh. He wants to see his potion book, and you know, Harry is kind of afraid that you know, if Snape will see all these notes and will learn about the Half Blood Prince, will be in trouble. So he gives them Ron's book, mm. and you know, and that kind of it kind of lets them off the hook, but at the same time, Snape still kind of gives them the tension. On the same day that there's supposed to be like the Quidditch final, so Harry has to, you know, not participate in the game and leaves Genie to be the seeker, and that and that's like a, something that kind of plays into the, you know, he actually has consequences because of how much he relied on that book. In the movie, he has no consequences on that whatsoever. I mean, the, I mean, the Gryffindor team still wins, but at the same time, you know. It does impact him somewhat. There is a was reason this why the first movie uh, where Ron came to be on the 
Quidditch team, right? This was the first movie? Uh, no, in the first movie, yes. But in the books, he joined the team in uh, On the Lord of Ah, but in the movie, like, this is the one where it's like, you know, him and Hermione having the relationship argument again and all that, right? Yep. yep. With Lavender, yes. Yep. Uh, Again, but, this is uh, where, you know, we come back to these last, I'm going to say the last, uh, Deathly Hallows Part 1, this movie, and Order of the Phoenix drag quite a bit. And a lot of the time it's to do with just dumb arguments and character things that I feel like we've already done and been through in previous movies. And the relationship thing between Ron and Hermione is one of them. I feel like we should. I feel like this is should already have been gone through. Even the fact that we have, like, yeah, going back to Goblet of Fire briefly, the entire argument of Ron not believing that Harry didn't put, you know, that Ron believing that Harry put his name in the Goblet of Fire, and Harry is like, "No, dude, I didn't. Why don't you trust me?" And it's like, you've been through so much shit with this guy at this point, Ron. Why would you even remotely think? that he would do this shit? Why would it even cross yeah. your mind that you wouldn't trust I, him at this point? You two have literally been in life-threatening situations before, and you've been like, I trust this guy with my life. This guy put his name in the Goblet of Fire. I know he did it. Fuck him. Fuck you! <laughs> Why are you such a dick? Why do they make this character seem like such a dick at all times? Like, and they even have this thing of where, like, you know, his character and his family is supposed to be kind of the poor wizard family, but he's, like, so fucking spoiled and such a fucking brat at times, and it's like, why? I get what you mean, Wolf, but we really, really need to get going on this, so I get what you're talking about. Just kind of pouring out, right? I, we make yeah. the rich people, right, the middle class people, we make them seem like really awesome, but then the poor kid, we gotta make him seem like a dick, like, at all times. Just gonna point that out. J.K. Rowling, completely loaded and rich, making the poor seem like assholes. Hmm. Hmm. Hmm on that, J.K. Rowling. Hmm on that. Seems like you have okay. a problem. Hmm. <laughs> oh, she definitely has some problems now. Oh, I know that, but it seems like she has other problems too. <laughs> but uh, anyway, where was I with this? So yeah, I prefer the movie. This is one of those that you know what I do prefer the movie, but the movie did transfer some parts well, you know. Like the scene where uh, Harry and Dumbledore in the cave where Dumbledore pulls out that uh, enormous fire spell yes that's, that was great that was cool to see that's great i mean even and, the scene know, where you know harry has to continue making dumbledore drink that like that's played really well like you know again yeah, that's a, the actor for dumbledore great. does really great there mm -hmm. that's <clears> great and also i think you know something because they knew where the story was going when they filmed the movie so there are a bit more hints on the fact that uh, dumbledore and snape Planned that Snape will kill Dumbledore. Mm -hmm. Like you can kind of, if you can kind of tell that this is where it's going. But at the same, but when I read this in the book, I was shocked. <laughs> and what? But that's really actually some Dumbledore dying. Um, did it hit you? Not really. <laughs> it's like okay, you know, yeah. Some, you know, I think this is another problem that, you know, people say that, you know, Harry Blood Prince is one of the best uh, movies in the thing. It's like, I, maybe it's because I saw it coming, but I, like, when I read that Snape killed Dumbledore in Harry Blood Prince, I was like, holy shit, like, what the fuck is even going on anymore? Like, what else can happen? And in the movie, it's just like, Okay, I guess he killed Dumbledore. Boo hoo. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I guess, <clears throat> I guess it's because we don't have a lot of character moments with Dumbledore in the movies, so it doesn't Probably. hit as hard, right? Like, there's a lot of times where you know, again, like we have a lot of large sections of the movie where Dumbledore is just not present, so killing him is kind of, meh. if you'd killed Ron or Hermione <laughs> or. You know, anyone else that's more prevalent in the movie, then it would probably have more of an impact. But Dumbledore's really not there a lot of the times. And it's this movie where he's 
really center focus with Harry, where we really get connected with him. And it's like, the you know, and, and, and it's not been that way until this movie. So that, again, it kind of sets way, off something... the flag of, uh, something's going to happen. And that's actually something I like both, both in the book and the movies, <clears throat> that I enjoy the Voldemort flashback scenes. Like that when we see Dumbledore yeah, yeah. recruiting the young, the young Tom Riddle into, into Hogwarts. So, you know, Tom Riddle actually asking, you know, Stockholm about Horcruxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, this is, a, this is an interesting thing that about the guy who played Tom Riddle in Chamber of Secrets wanted to come back and play the Diantum Real again for these flashback scenes, but he was deemed too old. And it's like, yeah, and Hermione, Hermione looks like a 16-year-old girl with, the, with, the, with his breasts. No. <laughs> like, all, not all of them don't look 16. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Send all I your angry good. comments to HC. Not oh, more. everyone knows that, that not all of them don't look 16. Not don't, saying anything about that. I'm just saying how you brought it up. I, I was quoting a nostalgia critic quote. Not one of my best moments. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> But yeah, I, I get where you're coming from, though. It's kind of like, meh, that's just one of those a little bit weird things, but movies for you. And, and also because, you know, we're, talk, we're talking visuals, though. So mm -hmm. again, but... Well, I get I you. I get you. I'm just giving you a hard time. But yeah. yeah thank you for that. Like, <laughs> like I told you, you can't really give Ron a hard time, so you're targeting me now. Yeah. All I need to be oh, is I mean, a redhead. You're not going to stop me from giving Ron a hard time. Because God, his <laughs> character... Okay, before we go into this again, Deadly Hollows. I will say one thing. Deadly Hollows is probably the first time I was actually hyped for a book because I had the thing pre-ordered and at the time, keep in mind that my English was was good, but it wasn't to the same level as it is now. Like, I won't be able to have a conversation with you back when the book came out. But, so, you know, this was a pretty big deal for me when I pre-ordered the book in English and actually managed to read throughout the entirety of it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't skip. I didn't uh, flip to the last page and see if he, if he lives or not. No, no, no. I wasn't, I wasn't one of these cheaters. No, no, no. I sat down and I read everything like a man. But, uh, but this is one of those books that I actually remember because I was able to do this. You know, English is obviously not my first language, as you can probably tell. Mm -hmm. But but this was something for me. This was some, oh shit! I managed to read this entire book in English. Go me! So yeah. this so this was a this was a thing for me, and you know, I also kind of like the idea that out of all my friends who were waiting for the Hebrew translation. I was ahead of the curve. I knew what was going to happen. I'm just, and it's like, I'm just sitting at the end. It's like, I can spoil you everything right now. <laughs> <laughs> and all of those assholes also believe they couldn't do it. Well, guess what? I did it. Suck it. But, um, so yeah, Deadly Hollows, I really enjoyed the book. I could, and the, I was actually pretty curious about them splitting the movie into two. Uh, actually, asking you right now, what what are your thoughts? On I think it's all right, but I think the first one does suffer somewhat from being quite slow. And honestly, it kind of just has to to do with the fact that the first uh, that part one is basically the the most air part of the book, which is Harry Potter goes camping. Yeah, and then you know we get to deal with the whole. Hey, it's Run is jealous of Harry and Hermione. He thinks they're growing too close now and they're having a relationship and it's just like Again, this is the whole Crocs talking. It's not necessary. I don't blame Ron for this. This is something, you know, his mind is a bit manipulated. No. I blame the character. He <laughs> should know better. Fuck him. He's being a bitch. He's being a spoiled brat. I'm tired of this same like again. I wouldn't mind if we hadn't have already done this multiple times in previous movies. 
again, if you watch the movies like as they came out, which was years between each of them, you might not notice it. But watching them like within the span of a week or two, yeah, you I get notice it. it, and it's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and it will make you hate this character. It will make you it may not, it may not make you hate this character, but it will make you loathe this character. And so, it does here. And the fact that he just comes back, like, okay. "Hey, I'm back. I saved your life. That's good enough, right? That makes up for everything." Fuck you. I'm glad Hermione says "fuck you" too. It's like, no, no, fuck you. <laughs> okay. So to the to the movies uh, to the movies themselves. Um, uh, you know, the one thing I really remember when part one came out was that everyone kind of called it the best Harry Potter movie for one reason. It was the most loyal to the book movie that came out at the time. And like, it, there were there were cuts, don't get me wrong, but this was the most They should have cut a lot more. Uh, and that's the thing, though, that you know, you say this, and then, but then you get the hard, the hardcore fans there who are like, "Oh my God, this is the best of the Harry Potter movies." Because this did not need to be it. two hours. It did not. I did not need two yeah. hours of Harry Potter camping, and then like literally almost thirty minutes of Harry and Hermione. They might, they might not. Ron's upset about it. I did not need like thirty minutes of that. That's. Almost how long that was, and I did but not need it. The one thing, the one thing I did love about it, though, is that is the scene where is the scene where Hermione reads the tale of, of the Deadly Hallows. Yeah, that, that was great. The animation, the animation, <clears throat> that scene, wonderful. That was great. Really enjoyed that. It was nice to see that animation style change and just to go to something like that. That was really great. I think that really fits with the theme of Harry Potter and works really and well for it. you know something? I know Dobby has a lot more, you know, a lot more, you know, a bigger role in the books because in the movies it's just in Chamber of Secrets and this, but I, in both books and in both the book and the movie, I was sad to see him go. I, uh, I will honestly meet and miss him. <laughs> Not that there's anything to miss really because, you know, this is the final thing, but, you know. Watching I, just the movies... Again, eh, I don't miss him. Actually, one uh, thing when I see this with uh, ex friends for the most part in details when they, on the opening day is that when he gives the speech about the, you know Dobby is a free elf at the end, people started people got out of the out of the chairs and started cheering for him. That that is one of my favorite movie movie moments ever. It was so hmm. awesome. Cool. But, um, yeah, but, but, and again, you know, there, there was this thing where when the movie ended, I was honestly surprised that this was the point where they decided to cut. Because I was like, you know, you split the movie into two, but then, I, but then you kind of got more than half the book done by this point. Like, but, uh, and I was surprised that, you know, and I was surprised that you know they actually that it doesn't like cut in the middle, it cut more towards the end. But then when you watch part two, I kinda see why they did this, because they want to give part two more more focus on the battle at Hogwarts, mm -hmm. which I'm happy got, you know, yeah. cent centerpiece in the final movie. Yeah, I, I agree. As, and you know, going to part uh, to part two real quick again. Uh, talking about uh, awesome movie going experiences, just this entire movie. You know, you this is why I love seeing movies with fandoms day one because you get all the best reactions <laughs> from the audience. And I just remember going to see this when it came out. I I bought tickets a week before with some with uh, some friends. And like I like, there were moments where the, you can tell the people that were fans. Like I know you don't care about this, but when Ron and my and Hermione kiss, and the entire theater just lost its mind. I love those moments, dude. I love it. No, that's fair. No, again, I get it. That's fair for those that are really interested and really care. Again, I get it, and I don't think it's you know. Again, I don't think the relationship is terrible. I just. For me, seeing them argue so much, seeing them have so many issues, and just Ron acting the way he acts consistently so many different times and never 
learning the lesson, like never growing. It just, it got old. It got, yeah, it got okay. old. Okay, I get what you mean. And it kind of soured me somewhat. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> but the thing, the thing I will say though um, about the fun is that you know this is one of those. The, the reason I brought that people were like so happy about uh, that the house found it following the book almost to a T is because then we you get to this where there are changes and there are I don't want to say cuts but there are some big changes here and then people are like oh this part uh, you know this part sucks because it uh, because I'm not loyal to the book again and it's like there's one change that I agree that I think it's kind of it's kind of dumb uh, and we'll get to it but at the same time the changes they did make, I honestly didn't mind much. Mm -hmm. uh, for, exa for example, like, uh, so let's say the change that I did mind. After the, after the final uh, battle, you know, we kind of find out that uh, Harry is the, is the true master of the other one. You know, this was, this was kind of part of Dumbledore and Snape's plan that, you know, um, that you know, trick uh, trick Voldemort into thinking that um, Snape is the is the owner of the other one. You know, you, you remember that. You're, yeah. You know what I'm yeah, I see. About. Yeah, I got it. And so we're now in with Harry being the master of it. So in the book, what he does is that he fixes the one that he breaks earlier, and then he leaves the other one near Dumbledore's grave, and he's just like. When I'll, when I'll die, the one's energy will die with me. And in the movie, it just breaks it. And I don't know, isn't it kind of pathetic that the strongest one ever is just like... I don't know, I think, it, I think it's fitting, personally. Yeah, again, it's that I, the symbolism. Don't you get it, HC? The symbolism, how power is so, how you know, attaining that kind of power is actually very weak. The symbolism, HC. Actually, the symbolism. <laughs> this is another. You say this is a joke, kind of. I do. But I do. but the thing is that there is actually something. The movie does symbolism better than the book, and this is something that because. I've seen people talk about because when there's the kind of the dream sequence where Harry is talking to Dumbledore in the um, in King's Cross White Edition or whatever, mm -hmm. there's I think it's in, it's during that scene where in the book where Dumbledore kind of you know admits to Harry that you know that Harry has all three you know deadly halls you know he has the invisibility which his father inherited for him. He has the he has the uh, thing. I don't. The, you know the, the, the stone. That allows, the stone yeah, and the then stone. the outer wand. <clears throat> yeah, the stone, the stone thing, and then he has the other. One. So the stone he kind of just leaves somewhere, and the wand, you know, whatever. But the thing is that the it kind of brings up the entire thing that Harry has all the treasures and does he's a true master of the master of that because. He didn't, because he didn't really do anything against that, he just accepted it. He accepted that, and that made him a true master, master of that. And, I, and, you know, people were so angry that, that this was cut from, from the movie, that explanation. I'm like, you know what? I actually prefer this to be, like, something for the, for the viewer to think about and to people to just come to that conclusion themselves. None of I don't need this shot in my face. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get you. I think, I think I would agree. Again, I have not read the book, so I don't have a good comparison to make, unfortunately. Um, another, another thing that I will say that I again, I saw people um, being mad about this, but I'll, I'm kind of happy about it. That you know, when uh, Harry wanted to meet Dumbledore's father. And he kind of, and you know, he kind of tells, and he kind of tells them that he, Dumbledore actually has a dark past, and you know, he's not that the good, you know, the good old man that Harry thought he was. So in the book, Harry, Harry is super mad about this. Like he suddenly he realizes that the man he idolized and the man 
he thought could do no wrong. He actually has a very dark past and that he was actually wanted the Deathly Hallows for himself. And that cost them, and that cost his sister's life. So in the book, he's very upset about this. But then in, in the movie, they just kind of, they just kind of, Write us to the side by him saying to Dumbledore's brother, I don't care what happened be- between you and your brother. And it's like, and on the one hand, I kind of like it because who has time for this shit with a battle of Hogwarts about to happen? People don't care. Let's be honest. People wouldn't care. But at the same time, this is interesting character development for Harry that, you know, at the end, where he kind of needs Dumbledore's support the most, in a sense. He, he suddenly, you know, the reality kind of strikes him that not all people are good. And Again, that, it, 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 it foreshadows well with what Sirius says much earlier on about, you know, not everyone is good. They do have some dark in them as well, like with his dad and himself and other yeah. stuff, right? The issue is, is that as far as the movies are concerned, this doesn't line up as well. Because when he says this, he's like, oh, that must include Dumbledore. But then in this point, it's like, eh. Yeah, it might include him, but eh, eh, yeah, and it's just, but uh, so yeah, it, just, it don't line up very well. I can see so why people would change, be. Yeah. So that change with Dumbledore is kind of one. I'm like, yeah, I get but, that. Uh, yeah, but you know, the battle for Hogwarts itself is great. You know, all the all the different uh, battles are all choreographed and everything. Everything is shot wonderfully. You can tell that people were like. This is our, this is the end. This is our final shot of this. We're going to make this as grand and epic as we can. And mm-hmm. by God, they do a good job. But they kill my I girl think... Tonks. And they kill Remus. Yeah, this is actually... Remus. When, Assholes. You know, Jackasses. When, yeah, Loopy and I was actually really sad to see go. That, um, that was really sad. They don't even kill him on screen either. He just gets an off-screen yeah. death. Like You just fl- you know, flash over like, oh, they're both dead. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So this Actually, this is, this, is something that, this is something that, you know, in the book, they kind of tease that Hagrid might have had, you know, an off-screen death too. And I remember that I told, I was up to my mother on the plot as I was reading it. And mm-hmm. she loves Hagrid because who doesn't love Hagrid? If you don't like Hagrid, you're a monster. This is but, true. And, I, and I told her about this and she was like, no, she didn't kill Hagrid. And then, like, and then, like, my, at my next reading session, where it was, which was the session I was, I finished the book, was, um, was suddenly we found out that Hagrid was actually kept alive in the by the Death Eaters, and I was like, oh, he's alive, and I, and you know, a monk telling my mother that Harry's alive, and up there, keeping her updated on the ending, I, she, I forgot to tell her that Hagrid's, uh, Hagrid's alive, and. She was like, I'm, but I'm sad that Hagrid's uh, Oh, no, 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 she tricked us. He's okay. And she's like, but then what did, why did you tell me that he's dead? It's like, because the book told me. <laughs> the book tricked me too. <laughs> but, um, but I think the best scene, at least in the movie, the book, it, it also works, but in the movie, I loved how they did it, was the scene where Harry Snape's memories. Wonderful scene. Mm-hmm. Like, like Alan Rickman, may he rest in peace. Wow, that that was. I, I every time I see this scene, I'm like, damn, I'm sad now. The the way he hugs Lily, my god. Agreed. I think that was really well done. And I, I think uh, Neville's scene in the in the final movie was also really well done too. Yeah, At the yeah, the way. The, mm-hmm. And that kind of brings us back to you know changes that you know the ma- the thing is that you know they kind of change it in dumb Voldemort's death in a sense that you know uh, that what killed him essentially is that the bell between. Him, him and Harry happens after Neville kills Nagini, and, mm-hmm. and and that means that you know Harry like uh, and then like uh, what kills him essentially is the use he used Harry's wand against him and the wand refused to attack his master. 
So in that sense, I know, and that's what happens in the book. But in the movies, I actually extended it that, you know, Voldemort can die until Nagini is gone. Mm -hmm. And people were, people were mad how it kind of contradicts everything. But at the same time, again, I, I kind of like this more because we can actually expand on the final, because, you know, Harry and Voldemort's final battle has been teased for so many years. We need to see them going at it to a bit more than just the Expelliarmus of the Cadabra finale. You know what I yeah. mean? I get you. We need a we need a bit more. We need a bit. So it's like grow up, people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, so overall, we got uh, through all of this epilogue. Nineteen years later, what are your thoughts? It's okay. I mean, I I don't really care. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know a lot of people are big, like, he called his kid Albus Cerverus. Oh, eh. Again, it, it's just, you know, Snape and Dumbledore just going off the movies, they're not built up enough to really care about. In the books, this is a different story. But in the movies, y you're not as connected, I feel. So... Uh, one thing I will say, or at least I was, wasn't, anyways. Yeah, but uh, you know, the the ending does touch me somewhere. That whenever, whenever I, whenever I see this movie, I do okay, I do get a bit emotional. You know, seeing the friend, seeing this final scene. But mm. and now it's the point where I ask you, can we talk about Cursed Child for a bit? No, go ahead. I have not seen okay. it, though, to be clear. Well, I should also clarify, I haven't seen it myself, ah. but, I did, but I did read that book script thing that they released. I've not read it either. Uh, do you mind spoilers? Yeah, I don't care. I'm not okay. going to go out of my way to read it, I'll be honest. So what was the, th so what was the thing that Harry Potter was missing all of this time? Time travel. No, it had time travel. No, 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 no. I'm talking time travel like years into the past. Fair enough. Like, it didn't have like, that, but it technically like, had time travel. Yeah, already. I know that in the prison hospital they had a bit of time travel. But no, no, no. I'm talking to you back to the future type of time travel. You know? Okay. That like, so, you know, we have uh, Albus uh, Severus going to Hogwarts. And he becomes friends with uh, Draco Malfoy's son, Scorpius. And the thing is that everyone believes that Scorpius is the child of Voldemort because Voldemort had a child. And, and you know, they kind of become friends and try to... And they kind of try to fix some of the stuff that Harry has done. Like, because apparently Cedric Diggory's father, like, uh, is suddenly, he suddenly hates Harry because Cedric was murdered during the Triwizard Tournament. So there was a so there was a whole thing that you know all of a sudden all the time tunnels have to be destroyed, but they kind of find one that's still active, so they go back in time and they change something, and then it kind of at some point there's like an, an apocalyptic future where Voldemort won and killed Harry, and and you know there's this entire thing and um, a huge mystery about who is Voldemort's uh, you know child when. Then you found out it's like this girl that's been hanging out with them, which is freaking obvious from page one that it's her. And then you found out that her mother is Bellatrix, which implied the two had, had sex, and it's kind of disgusting, honestly. But, <laughs> but, you know, it, but then they go back to the night where Voldemort kills Harry's parents, and they kind of... And they kind of stop his daughter in the in the background, and Harry has a chance to actually save his parents, but decides not to do it because it will change history. And there's and then there's also a thing about you know there is an interesting idea about Harry being a bad father, which is an interesting idea because you know he didn't really have much of a role model in his life to how to be a parent. But the thing is, it only applies to Alba Seven, like the older son James and the younger daughter Lily. They're fine. Like he's a great father to them. He's only, 
and it's like it doesn't work if he's uh, if he's the best yeah, one of the he, under king. Yeah, that's not how and, it works. Yeah. yeah. So there's this, and then there's the I don't just fan fiction stuff. Like one of the things that Deadly Hallows establishes is that after you know the whole crux within Harry died, Harry could no longer speak to speak to snakes. So, and then all of a sudden, they kind of, the plot kind of needs him to do it again, and he does. And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> and Ch- Charles Chad is one of those that, you know, I, kinda, I had problems with it when I first read it, but I kind of had fun going back to that world again. And then all of and then, uh, then more. Sounds like J.K. Rowling just wanted to faff about. And here's the thing, you know, you know how she's going on and on about how she shouldn't have made uh, Ron and Hermione at the end? Apparently, when uh, among the many times that Albus and Scorpius some fuck around with time, one of the things that, ha- that happens is that Ron and Hermione don't end up together. Cool. And, the reason th- and the reason they kind of want to change it is because Scorpius has a crush on their daughter. Cool. Glad I didn't read or watch this. Hopefully it doesn't become a movie, because I'm probably not going to watch oh, it. Oh my god. You know something? I, if I watch it, it will be with my, with my... We like to watch bad movies and we're fond of fans. Yeesh. <laughs> so, with that said, uh, anything else about Harry Potter? Like I said, we're not... Actually, you want to talk about Fantastic Beasts for just a second? All I'll say sure. is that Go for it. I, I started watching the first one and I didn't like it. I am not watching it and I heard the second one is I've not heard good things, to say the least. Isn't David Tennant in that one too, or no? Fuck if I know. I really have no idea. Like the first one, doesn't he play the main villain or something, Grindelwald, or no? And that's Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp, that's who it was. I've heard he played that part pretty well, but that's about the only good thing I've heard from it. Well, that's the one I haven't. So oh, okay. really, I again, I only saw the first. He's in the second. Ah, okay. I've heard mixed things, to say the least. Lightning does not strike uh, twice. It seems. Uh, let's say but, things and um for Harry Potter, right? I would say, as final thoughts, you know, going back now as an older adult and kind of rewatching and a little bit of rereading, but mostly rewatching a lot of the story and seeing it re unfold again and just going through all of it. I'm of the opinion now that it's not as good as I remembered it being. <laughs> it, it's yeah, it, it's like, not bad. Know, some stuff, I don't yeah, hate it. Some stuff you know, stuff I, age. I, it's some of it age aged spoiled. badly, but I also think it just, it, it was never really written a, the best thing in the world, right? I don't, again, like, overall, like, not just it's, not just because of age, but just overall, I don't think it's the best written thing ever. I think there is better stuff out there, and I think I have, as of now, experienced more interesting and more unique and overall, yeah, more interesting and better worlds characters and pieces of fiction since this yeah but i don't you know, but to be clear i don't hate harry potter i do think it's good and okay but i think there is better stuff out there and i think right that it was a good opener to me personally to get into the idea of fiction to get into fiction reading to get into you know these fictional worlds and enjoy them more i think harry potter was a good start for that journey but I don't think it is something I would define that journey. So, by, right? Better, better stuff has come out. Better stuff has been done. Well, but, yeah. but I did, yeah. But I will say that you know, in terms of stuff that kind of caught on, like Harry Potter, like when you look at that, you know, teen books turned movie franchises, like like Twilight or Maze Runner or Hunger Games. I would still stand my foot down that Harry Potter is not going to be touched in that area. Because not, nothing, nothing, be yeah, nothing that. does better than it. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think Harry Potter, if you look at Hunger Games, if you look at, I think it's uh, 101, is that it? No. 
It's that wow. it, again. There's been a lot of them that you know have been made into movies. All of that, you know, I think Harry Potter is stands above the rest. The only one that even mm-hmm. remotely might be able to come close would be Hunger Games, and that's like still so far down below. Oh, actually, uh, I like Hunger Games, but that's a podcast for another day with all the stuff <laughs> I have to say about it. Again, it's it's Harry Potter definitely stands as top that pile still. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I don't think that's an extremely high bar looking yeah, back now. And again, but... th- yeah, you know, again, uh, this is not saying that, you know, it's perfect or anything. It mm-hmm. has problems. But when it comes to stuff that try to do its shtick, this is still the king, you know. Twilight is not <laughs> good, however you look at it. Maze Runner, fuck, I fell it's... asleep in the first one. It's out and... there. It's it's somewhere out there. Hunger Games is also uh, somewhere out there. And... Uh, Hunger Games, actually, I like, but the, I have problems with it too. And what what is it? Divergent. Divergent. I That's the one I was thinking of. That one's I way have, out there. <laughs> I haven't read or seen any of it, so I've seen a bit. It's for... it's something. All I know about it is that you know in the it's like Maze trailers, Runner. It exists. Uh, all I know is that, you know, in the Honest trailer for it, they just show John Bell in the recording studio, and it's like, wait, didn't we do this already? That's the Hunger Games. <laughs> so, it, that's it, all I Again, know. Divergent and Maze Runner exist. That, that's, all the, that's all they'll get. They exist. Oh, God. Fair enough. That's all they deserve. So, so, with all that said, I think that's it for this episode of The Outcast. We hope you enjoyed. What are your thoughts about Harry Potter? It be it books, movies, video games, or Fantastic Beasts, even you can tell us all about it in the comment section below, on our Tumblr, which is Bellcast Steam, and on our Twitter, which is Bellcast with a capital B, capital C. So until next time, I was HC. I was Wolf. And we will talk to you all next time. Take care. Bye-bye.